Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Our guest today is Melissa Pickering. She's the head of interactive play at the Lego Group. She's an entrepreneurial leader, a product innovation specialist, and a digital transformation expert. She also recently gave a TED Talk on how tech should be designed for kids. Melissa, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Interactive play. That sounds like a really fun job. Yes, yeah, it, it absolutely is. And um, it, it basically is our term for you know, kids are playing differently and they have been for a while in terms of the introduction of, of screens. And so uh, we firmly believe, though, that play in the physical world is, is still so important. So our primary task is to look at how do we leverage digital technology to, to further enhance uh, the physical play for, for kids around the world. Amazing. So your work in particular it sounds like it's quite a bit about digital and tech and the ways in which children will play back in, I guess, and adults too, right? Adults still play with Legos, Um, but the way that we sort of play back and forth then between different modalities. Yes, that's, that's absolutely true. And, and sometimes we call it a one reality or fluid play, just, just noting that no matter the, the mode or medium, there's, there's so many different ways to have a playful, experience and you know whether it's using robotics and encoding or or augmented reality or or other types of technologies our our first and foremost starting point is what is a fun playful experience and and then from there we move to then how how do we how do we do that i love that point and one of my favorite aspects of your ted talk is that you really take us back to basics and explain what play is and why children can engage even in nature to, you know, why nature is such a wonderful inspiration for play. Tell us a little bit more about how tech should be designed for kids. Yes. So, you know, there's, we, there are a couple different types of, of play and particularly what I reference in my talk is this notion of free play or, or open-ended play. And, and in that space that's really where we where we see imagination and, and creativity uh, that kids have really coming to life and and the th- three key principles for uh, free play is is one around intrinsic motivation so so experiences that uh, naturally you are you are motivated to in to, to to do and not uh, the opposite of that would be an extrinsic motivator. So these are things with where, you know, games with, with rules and, and points and in some of these achievements that you're trying to make, that would be, that would be the opposite of intrinsic motivation. So one is intrinsic motivation. Two is active engagement. So uh, this is where, you know, you're, you're actively cr- creating, doing, um, being in in a play experience, uh, the opposite of that would be passive. So this is where you know watching uh, you know something on a screen for an extended period of time, and we get sort of in that passive mode. And and then three, of course, it should go without saying that we really believe in those joyful moments. So in our design process and in the team, we we talk a lot about what are those magic moments that. Um, really invoke joy, and if you think about, it, sometimes magic moments can can come from a, a a a struggle as well. So that feeling of being proud once you've you've achieved something, like practicing jump rope, and you finally get um, what what it is that you want. So so those joyful magic moments, they don't necessarily um, have to be you know about surprise and wonder all the time, but also can come from maybe a, a hard uh, struggle that you've been working on for some time. Yeah, as I'm listening to you describe these different layers of play or levels of play, I keep thinking not just about children at play, but about how those lessons are so applicable to our professional lives too, that if we can approach our work with the idea that we are at play, that that could be transformative in some ways. Have you given much thought or do you talk about that at a cultural level inside LEGO? We, we do. And, and I think it, you know, it, it sort of goes without saying in our work because we are uh, in and around the, the Lego brick uh, medium on a, on a daily basis and, and having, you know, brainstorm sessions and, and design, um, you know, drawing out user journeys and, and, 
and using all kinds of different different things to to, to lean in and and it's a very collaborative culture I I've, I find at, particularly at Lego and so um, all of our design processes are extremely uh, collaborative in of themselves and so with that saying then inherently it, it is very active, right? When, when you're sort of leaning in and participating in different uh, design uh, brainstorm sessions, you are, you are actively engaged. Um, so it's, I would say, because it is what we're doing, we are toy, de toy designers, it, it does come a bit, a bit natural with the, with the, with the territory. Absolutely. Can you take us inside? Um, I, I know you might not be able to share a lot of insight into internal sessions like that, but do you have any stories that you could share that would sort of bring to life some of the, the current projects or even just the, the mindset that you tend to see among your teams? Uh, yes. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I like to in, enforce in our team is is never really you know, taking ourselves too seriously. And, and it's, it's funny how sometimes, you know, a, a conversation or a meeting about a certain color, uh, or of, of, of a, um, on, on, of a brick on a model can, can get into something very in, intense, right. Or the name of a, of a monster of an, of, a, <laughs> of a new story that we're creating. And, and sometimes it's, it's really important to, to take a step back and, 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 and have a laugh and, and think about, you know, we, we are designing toys and, and new experiences <laughs> and stories for, for kids. So, uh, so don't get too angry about, uh, <laughs> about whether that should be a light green or, or dark green. Right. So, um, I think that's one uh, key principle that I particularly as a leader in, in our team like to reinforce. And, and so that just naturally, uh, creates a, a little bit of a lighthearted atmosphere in, um, one of the, one of the funny things we have a, I don't know if you're familiar, we had a, a product released about three years ago that was a robotics product. So it's called Boost. And one of the, you could build one of five different models and one of the models was a cat. And the cat's name is Frankie. And, and in the experience, you can, you can feed Frankie a, a, a milk, you can build a little milk bottle and then hold it up to Frankie's mouth, which has a sensor in it. And then, and then Frankie, the cat uh, will meow and, and purr. And so um, there was yes. a, uh, there was a, a, a prototype being worked on for that. And in, in this big open space, um, I think for, for an entire week, uh, when the designers and developers were continuing to work on and work out the kinks, all you could just hear was just a rep repetition of a cat meowing and purring <laughs> in this, this big, uh, atrium. And, and, you know, it's, it's just little things like that where, um, it, it, it does make it, make it, uh, make you take things a little bit less seriously. You know, projects like Boost, thank you so much for sharing that example. I, I love that image. And the products like Boost are so interesting because they, they really encapsulate that fluid play that you were describing, that fluid motion between the digital world and the physical world. And our children, I think, uh, are, are sort of uniquely positioned to well, well, we're positioned, I think, as innovation leaders to help them navigate those distinctions between what is reality and what is not. So can you share with us some more, you know, I, I love your, again, in your TED Talk, you talk about some of those distinctions and how we need to be responsible in our ways of designing environments of play for children, especially as coders and engineers. Tell us a little bit more about what you've learned at Lego and, and why it matters to take an ethical and where possible a participatory approach to design for games for kids. Yes, I think, um, you know, kids are, they are still developing and, and developing that sense of control and understanding, you know, what is, what is right and, and wrong. And, and so the more that we can lean into um, to, to provide a, a space to nurture uh, the creativity that they already have and, and fuel the imagination that they already have. I think we, you know, I personally believe we will then naturally have um, uh, strong, uh, you know, 21st century citizens in, in the future. And, you know, particularly in our design process, we, we do a number of, we create prototypes, we, we test with kids, we test with kids all the time and, and, and work with them and get feedback. And there are times when, you know, there's been a couple examples in the past where we want to provide an engaging experience, right? And, and, you know, we've had implementations of an experience and we put it in front of kids 
And then what's happened, you know, maybe we use a little mechanic, like giving little rewards as they continue to build something or, or go through an experience. And, and then what we found is just watching the kids, then they become all of a sudden their, their mind and, and is transformed from the physical world and the building and, and play experience and more about then how to get more points on the screen. And that's where we've had the halt in our design process and take a step back and say, okay, is this, is this the behavior that we want to create? And, and like, are there other mechanisms that we can use to inspire and motivate that, that build and play loop without using the some of these game mechanics that if overused can can take the kids in a different direction. Yes, it's such an interesting balance between the mechanics and then the the way children will use it and also sort of how the imagination plays a space and, and, and whether those mechanics allow space for imagination. It's so many different factors to be thinking about. Can can you tell us a little bit more about other innovation stories coming out of your team? Um, yes. So we have one that was uh, just launched or not launched and it's going to be launched later this year, but it was actually just announced uh, last week. And we've teamed up with Lego has teamed up with Nintendo and, and it's a uh, Lego Super Mario. And that is a, you can see on online, there's a interactive uh, Mario that, that kids can, can play with and, and, and build uh, out different Lego levels for, for them to, to play their, their Mario in. And that has been a really interesting journey for the team because, you know, it is, it is about a game, you know, it's, it's, it's teaming up with a, a game company and it is about creating this, this game and using these icons, but in a, in a space that gives kids the the opportunity to be imaginative and creating their own, building their own game levels out of, out of Lego bricks. Uh, so that's one specific one that's, that's hot off the press as of, as of last week that we'll be launching later this year. That's incredible. And what about the digital aspects? Is that, is that a particularly tech enabled uh, product? Yes. Yep. So, it, so the, the, the little Mario is, um, does have technology in it, which allows it to, to react in, uh, from the different bricks. So if you hold it over a red brick, then, then he's sort of experiencing fire on his feet and these sorts of reactions. That's incredible. So what are some of the technologies that you at Lego are already strongly implementing and what do you think is on the horizon? That's a good question because we we often don't, you know, we're not innovating from a technology perspective and that's where our, you know, our briefs that we work on, we don't take a starting point of of looking at technology where we challenge ourselves instead to look at uh, new play ex- experiences and and what is relevant for kids play you know, also mapping to the the world around them. So thinking about these trends around, you know, being more mindful of what's happening in the world with, with sustainability, right? And, and, you know, when we think about um, what the, the new cities that, that, that kids will be in and, and how do we, how do we create play experience that's evolving and relating to them as they are, um, you know, grow, growing up in, in the world. And so that's, we look at these macro trends and then and then create uh, play experience briefs from that, and then we use existing technology or or maybe some sort of t- technology components to in order to deliver to that play experience. So that's how we turn turn that on its head. So we're not necessarily looking at you know the next new innovative uh, technology, but but really what is what is the play that's relevant for for kids moving forward. I love that. And I, you know, I think a lot of conferences, I've heard that same wisdom that we need to put the, uh, our people in front of the technology itself. Can you share, I heard you mention your technical briefs, your creative briefs, um, and, and also just the an- analyzing macro trends. Can you share with us the way that storytelling plays a role in those aspects of your innovation process? Uh, yes, absolutely. So I would say storytelling is is used quite often uh, when we look at user journeys. So what are our key personas in experiences? And of course, we of course have the kids, but then we talk about what are their passion points and and tell a little story about 
these kids also, um, you know, the the world the world that they live in and and what is the family that they live in. And so that is a story in of itself in helping us really think about the the user now and in, in the future. And then we use uh, storytelling, particularly in, in our area, on there's a challenge in, in communicating these new digital physical play experiences internally because it is tough to kind of imagine and, and see. And we're so used to looking, being able to look at a physical model and really right away seeing and understanding the play. Like when you see a, a, a Disney castle, you can kind of understand and see the, the play there. But when you talk about this, you know, this this robotic cat that that um, you can code in order to um, in order to, to make it come alive, that's a little bit intangible. So we have to rely heavily on uh, storyboards, um, metaphors, these things just for internal selling in as well as 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 bringing people on board in the journey of of, of pushing the innovation of these these new digital physical play experiences so i think we use it in in two different ways in that yes yeah, so it's a way of really deeply understanding the the players and also generating buy-in internally let's start yes. i love that you used when it comes to painting really clear and accurate images of your of children at play. I love that you use the term passion points. I think people talk a lot about pain points of their consumers, but not necessarily their passion points. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, yes. So, you know, this can be something as, as simple as uh, passion points of, of horses or Star Wars or s some of these these. Um, unicorns is a, is a very uh, <laughs> popular one at the moment. Um, so that's that's what we we think of, and and it's really it's really just the, the interests and the particular. You know, we also talk about play types. So 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 certain ways that that certain kids and, and their personalities tend to um, tend to like to play. So whether it's a first person role play or third third um, person role play. So we we blend those and. Um, passion points, just their interests and their passion points change as they, as they, they not only grow up, but then um, also in, as these, these trends happen too. So maybe, you know, a strong passion point for a lot of kids is, is around sports, right. And, and um, things, and, and that is also something we have to take into our consideration in, in our design process. I love that. Yes. I, I, I was laughing to myself thinking about my five-year-old right now somehow found mermaid unicorns <laughs> both trends are wow. so, so <laughs> strong right now that now they're making this like hybrid model <laughs> so oh my gosh yes and i'm sure like three months from now it'll be something different but that's what we're into right now um and let's let's talk a little bit more about buy-in internally too because this is a this is a topic that's come up a lot in my interviews with thought leaders like yourself so when you're generating internal buy-in, what does that look like at the moment where the seed of an idea is just starting? And then how does that change as a project actually gets approved and, and is underway? We, you know, we have a, we work with a pretty standard innovation gate process, um, but it's usually in terms of that seed transforming into a approved project, um, it has has I would say three uh, key key elements and and one is where people can everyone in the organization they can really um, f feel and experience um, the, the 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 new play and so that's where we have to use storytelling to to somehow evoke some sort of emotion and and you know we oftentimes have to make uh, what we call fakeotypes so so prototypes that that aren't necessarily um, actual working but 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 just to get people's hands and, and experience them. So they, they have an emotional and people meaning leadership. Um, and so they have an emotional uh, at attachment to that. Um, you know, kids, uh, feedback from kids, we, we, we do so much kids t testing. And so that's a, a key point of, of really sharing our journey of, of, where we've been, you know, there's not, not all kids ex test experiences, uh, not, are, are very good. You know, it's also, we found it's, it's helpful to share the, the, the kids tests where the experience actually completely flopped. Cause then that also 
provides more credibility to to the selling in process when you sort of share those those stumbles as well through the through the design journey. Oh, tell me more about that. So is that a way of showing that you were responsive to feedback and you were avoiding sort of epic failure by being willing to pivot and change? Yes, that and 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 also, you know, it's um when people just keep talking about, oh, and the kids love this, and they thought it was the best play experience, and they, 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 um, they, you know, made all these things where it can we everyone hears that a lot, and so it's also kind of a, a jerked rally when you hear. Actually, we tried this um, new new model, and and the kit, you know, all of the the kids of this age group hated it, and they just were <laughs> so bored, and they were you know wanted to go play Fortnite, and and so that also. <laughs> Um, helps people, I think, remember um, as 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 well as make make everything else that that we're sharing more more credible. Um, in addition to what you're saying of 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 then okay now then we we took in that feedback and then we 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 adjusted. Um, but the the whole story becomes a lot more more credible. I love the two. I feel like the the two key points that you made there that I want to lean into most are one, the surprise element of adding something like that into your innovation story. Um, Adding the failure, I guess I should say, into your innovation story creates an element of surprise that will make it more memorable to the listener. So that's one point. And then the second point is really the humility to say that and to sort of um, rattle how things are typically done. I Uh, We work with a lot of scientists and engineers at Untold, and it's interesting if we're supporting them, for instance, in designing a a deck or a scientific poster for a conference, we'll make sure that we really clearly understand the audience that that they want this design to be for, because we'll oftentimes hear that if it's too beautiful, if it's too professionally designed, the scientific community will um, be much more skeptical of the the validity of the findings wow that's that's so interesting (laughs) yeah so it it just reminds me of what you're that you know what you're talking about which is the fallacy of kind of overemphasizing the impact or the, the the market potential or or how positive it's going to be you're sort of going to generate skepticism if you're overly optimistic because people like to be i think you know make sure that that we're all kind of being reasonable and and using logic but but yeah in the scientific community if something is over designed it can be seen as less credible huh that's interesting i wouldn't have i wouldn't have expected that so who needs to buy in to these innovation stories so uh the the leadership teams uh need need to need to buy in and um in order for I guess the seed of an of an idea to then become a, a project that is 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 resourced and, and supported, and and the leadership you know is from all different backgrounds and and cultures as well as as experience in Lego. So um, so there's a range of, of of stakeholders. It's it's like basically you know getting investment, except it's it's one investment board and and instead of a number of different uh, invest. Uh, venture firms out there. Um, so that's right. Yeah, absolutely. And so, how do you ensure that you know that the, the innovations that you're sharing and the stories that you're sharing with those stakeholders that they are aligned with their needs and their their mission and their values? I think it's it's definitely a um, it's a, definitely a learning process. Um, I think one of the things that I share with my team is is making sure you know a lot of times we go into presentations and and you just want to use the entire 30 minutes or 45 minutes or whatever it may be just to get as much information out there and 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 to give your whole pitch and 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 squeeze it in and um what i've encouraged the team to do is you know make sure you're not taking up the entire time like leave at least 10 minutes or something in just to understand the the questions and the types of questions are asked because that's the the biggest opportunity to get a little bit more insight into what each person's agenda has to then do a loop again and and so you're you you can continue sharpening the the presentation because the worst and I've, I've seen this happen many times and I've actually experienced myself is when you you just use all of your breath to say what you want to say and then and then you know you get feedback later that maybe the 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 idea is not going forward with that and you don't don't really 
have an opportunity to understand why. And, and, and when you have that panel of, of the leaders in the room that normally have extremely packed schedules, then absolutely take the opportunity to understand the questions and what's on their top of mind. Yes, that's such good advice. I think, especially as ideas get shelved and communications lacking. And I think there's a lesson there too for those listening to this podcast who are in leadership roles and you other ones approving innovation projects to make sure that that feedback is very clear to the innovators and the people on your team who are working so hard to come up with ideas. Because one of the most challenging aspects of being innovative is just the resiliency that it takes to accept when something doesn't get green lighted and understand when it gets shelved or or killed. And so, yeah, I just think that there's there's probably advice on, on both sides of, of that equation there. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. So what other advice would you give to innovators as they prepare to convey their great ideas? Hmm. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I guess it's, it kind of goes along with your um, your focus and the and the focus of this podcast is is not underestimating the the power of of storytelling um, and and that is you know I think about I've watched many 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 presentations too and and um, the ones that you can you can really remember are where you know you you are forced to be transported into a world or relate to a you know your your walk through an experience from the point of view of a 8 year old girl and you just you you have these little details in in the presentation and just to help paint a, a common picture in people's heads and and i i just i firmly believe that that's a um, a, a very powerful way. Maybe it can feel, um, you know, manipulative sometimes, but at the end of the day, it is, it is, it is about stirring the emotions in your listeners and, and storytelling is um, absolutely a powerful way to do that. Well, and I think too, it's definitely authentic when it's coming from a, a place where th there's so much truth to that. I, I look at my children playing with Legos, and I think if you as an innovator are able to share an insight into what that play looks like and who that person is, um, I know that from a consumer's perspective, that's so valuable and, um, and, and not at all something that should be viewed as, you know, storytelling in the sense of lying, right? It's it's really about bringing someone's experience to life and making sure that that aligns really clearly with what the vision is for that innovation. So I love that advice. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for being on the podcast. I um, am so humbled to have you on and I, I can't wait to hear uh, more of your thoughts as uh, as you continue to put out amazing work at Lego. Thank you. Thanks for, for having me on. And I love uh, the mission that, that you guys have. I think it's very important. So thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 